What we're going to be doing today is talking about beam column design. And if you'll remember from when we first started talking about beam columns, there is an interaction equation that you have to use to determine whether or not the column's good enough. You can't just check it as a column based on the axial load, then check it as a beam based on bending moment, and you know, check the two of them. You have to actually consider what happens when the two of them are acting together. Um, so hopefully this equation looks familiar. That's the interaction equation. And remember, this comes from your, from your code in, um, in section in chapter H. And, and also, be aware too, just remember that this has to be, this is only used if that ratio there, PU over PCPN, is greater than or equal to 0 0.2. Okay, if, if, if it's not, then you have to use H1-1B. Um, but for today, we're going to stick with this. Um, now, what I want to do is, what I want to talk about here is that, um, if you remember when we did that first example on that first day, when we use this interaction equation, it was fairly tedious to calculate. You know, you, we've got to calculate the column capacity. We've got to calculate the moment capacity. And that was fairly tedious, especially since the uh, section wasn't in some of the tables, some of the more convenient tables, that uh, W10 by 30 that we had. So I'm going to talk to you, you know, when we're talking about design, where you're, gonna, where you're going to have to iterate and possibly check multiple sections, you want to do this fairly quickly. So I'm going to talk about how we can speed this up, we can speed the analysis up, and, and do this more quickly for design. Okay, so here's what I want to do. So again, just remember, this is only good if this condition is satisfied, which it will be for the examples in this video. All right, so let me, let me rewrite this here. Okay. So I'm going to rewrite this, and all I'm going to do really, I'm just going to distribute that 8 ninths into the parentheses there. So if I do that, okay, it looks something like this. So I've got 8 ninths times mux over phi b x mnx plus 8 ninths over that value there. Okay, so all I did was just distribute that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a definition. Okay, I'm going to make a definition, and of course, you know, there's a 1 here. Okay. So I'm going to define some terms here. If I take, just basically I'm taking the coefficients on the, on the axial load and the moments here. So I'm going to take this coefficient there, that coefficient, and that coefficient. And this one here, I'm going to call that P. This, I'm going to call that B sub X. And this, I'm going to call B sub Y. Okay, I make that definition. And now, if I rewrite this, what I have, okay, what I have is this first term just becomes P times PU. The second term is BX times MUX. And then that third term is BU times MUY less than or equal to 1.0, all of that. Okay. And now what I've done, you know, obviously this simplifies things, but each of these terms, the P, the BX, the BY, they can all be determined for a section ahead of time. As long as you know what the length of the section is, you can figure out what those terms are. It's just, then it just becomes, you need to know what the axial load is and what the moments are, possibly about both of the axes. Um, you just need to know those, you can plug that in, and you can determine whether or not the section is adequate. Okay. And it turns out, this is probably no surprise, there is a table that has all of these values in there. And it turns out to be very convenient for doing these types of calculations. So. That table is table 6-1, and, um, and I'm just going to show you. All right. So here's table 6-1. Um, it begins, what I'm looking at here, I'm looking at page 6-89. You can see you've got all the different shapes. So in this one here, I've got a W10 by 26, by 22, by 19. And you can, based on the length, and again, this is going to be the length either KL, the effective length of the column, or LB, the unbraced length of the beam, and it even says that right here in, in the margin. Um, you look up that length, and you can pull up what those values are. Okay, you can pull up BX, you can pull up P. BY is down at the bottom. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. But this is a very handy table. So what I want to do now is I want to show you, using this kind of shortcut here, I want to show you how we can 
determine whether or not this, col this beam column over here is okay from that first example we did, just using the shortcut and using the table. Okay. All right. So if you remember back, again, the first, the first class period where we talked about beam columns, if you remember, we had this example here. We've got a column with a 50 kip axial load, and then there's that 35 kip wind load. And just to kind of speed things up here, remember we found the moment from that. It turned out you get a maximum moment of 105 kip feet from that. Okay, so now let's use these values to calculate and see whether or not that, whether or not that beam is adequate, that beam column. All right, so this is table, table 6-1. So you go in there and you find the W10 by 30 that we're using here. Okay, so here's the W10 by 30, and of course it's got BX and P for that. Now, um, again, here's something nice about this table. It has all the sections in it. If you remember from that first example, that W10 by 30, it wasn't in the column design chart. It was, it was too small for that. This table here, table 6-1, it has all of them. And so even if you're just designing a column or analyzing a column, you can come to this and you can actually use this to analyze columns that aren't in that table. So that's kind of nice too. Okay, so I'm using table 6-1, and this is on page 6-88. For that W10 by 30, And again, so the, for, for both of them, if you look over there, for both of them, for both the column and the, um, the beam aspect of it, it's 12 feet, right? The unbraced length is 12 feet. The effective length on the column is 12 feet. So if you look up in the table then for P, okay, if you look up in the table P at 12 feet, okay, so you come over here, P at 12 feet, it is, it says it's 5.64, okay, but you got to be careful. If you look up in the heading, it tells you that those values are P times 10 to the third. Okay, those values are very small. It's, it's the inverse that we're talking about of the, of the capacity. So those values are very small, so the values in the chart are multiplied by 10 to the third, so what you have to do is whatever you read in there, that's times 10 to the minus third. Okay, so for P, it's equal to 5.64 times 10 to the minus 3. And the units on that are 1 over kip. It says that in the table. Um, it has to be that, right, if you look back at the definition. The units for bx are 1 over kip feet. And if you look, again, if you look on that table at 12 feet, then the value for that is 8.54 times 10 to the minus 3. 1 over kip feet. Okay, and again, that's LB equal to 12 feet. Um, you know, it's kind of, actually, this is kind of a nice table because um, you don't have to really determine which limit state you're in. You can just basically read off the table and it, it figures all that out for you. It's based on, it, it figures out all the different limit states as far as the beam goes between plastic hinge, lateral torsional buckling, all that. Okay, so, um, so this is where we are. We've got the values from the table now. So let's go ahead and figure out whether or not this, this beam column is going to work. So I just plug it in. So remember, we've got P times PU plus BX times MUX plus BY times MUY has to be less than or equal to 1.0. Okay, now, and you remember this from the first, from the first day we talked about this. We only have bending about the strong axis, so this part of it right here, right, that's going to be zero. So we won't have to worry about that. We can just plug everything else in here. So if I plug the numbers in, I've got 5.64 times 10 to the minus 3 over kip times PU, which was 50 kip, okay. plus that 8.54 times 10 to the minus 3 over kip feet times 105 kip feet. Okay. And if you do that, if you do that calculation, you get 1.18, okay. which is greater than 1.0. So that, so that beam column is no good, right? It's not going to work according to these calculations. Um, this brings up an interesting question because if you remember, this is the exact same example we did 
that first day when we were talking about beam columns, but we found out that it worked. When, that, when, we, did that rec when we did that calculation, the ratio was 0 0.96 was what we got at the very end, and so it should work. So my question is, what's wrong here? What's happened? And um, I'll tell you right now, it's not a math error, right? I've done all the calculations correctly. That 1.18 is exactly what, what should happen, but there's something we haven't accounted for. So I want you to take a minute and think about that, and you'll see a, you'll see a URL. I want you to go, there'll be a, you go to that URL, that, that web address, and there'll be a, a quick you know, text box that you can answer. What do you think? Why do you think this has happened? What have, we, what have we neglected here? So I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Go ahead and pause the video while you do that, but please go to that uh, URL that you see and, and tell me what you think is happening here. Okay, now I hope you took that seriously and, and you came up with what you think the reason is. Um, let me tell you what it is. I don't know if this is obvious or not, but we forgot about CB. So remember when we did this example, based on the loading, and, and this is for the bending part of it, based on the loading, CB is equal to 1.32. Now if you go to table 6.1, what you'll find, if you, if you look at the, you know, there's some notes at the very beginning of the table, you'll find that they've assumed CB is equal to 1.0 which is conservative, right? And that's why when you look at what happened here, it looks like it's not going to work. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add CB into that. So let me show you how to do that. And remember, this is just for the bending part of it. So I'm looking at this part right here, the 8 ninths times MUX over phi B MNX, okay? It's just this part right here. And remember this, all of that, that was BX. Now, you can't see it here, but CB is actually in here, right? When you calculate the beam capacity, if it's lateral torsional buckling, then CB is, is in there. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that lateral torsional buckling is controlling, and how would that work? And the way that's going to work is, remember, CB is in here, but they assumed it was 1.0. So what you can do is you can say, I'm going to call this BX prime, okay, BX prime, which will account for CB. I'm going to say that's equal to 8 over 9 times CB times VB MNX like that. Okay, so I'm going to put, so CB is going to end up in the denominator. So what this is, it's BX over CB. So all I got to do is you, you take, basically all you have to do is you take BX that you get from the table, divide by CB, and now you've accounted for it. Okay, so if I calculate that, okay, so BX was 8.54 times 10 to the minus 3 per kip, kip feet. And I'm going to divide that by CB, so 1 over 1.32. Now when you do that calculation, you get 6.47 times 10 to the minus 3 over kip feet, like that. Okay, so um, now remember, this is assuming lateral torsional buckling. And what we've done, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky, when we increase the capacity of the beam, Bx goes down. Right? It's an inverse relationship. So the fact that the, that the beam has increased in capacity because we're accounting for CB means that this value here should be smaller than that value there. Um, so remember, this is just for lateral torsional buckling. We've, we're assuming lateral torsional buckling because we're using CB. So now what we have to do, we always have to do this. When you use CB greater than 1.0, you've got to check, is the plastic hinge going to control at that point? So the way we can check that, I'm going to call this BXP, right, it's the, it is BX for the plastic hinge capacity. The way you can find that is you just set L equal to zero, right? If you look in this chart in table 6-1 and you set L equal to zero, that tells you what the plastic hinge capacity is. So this is equal to BX with LB equal to zero, like that. Okay, and so if you look that up, if you look that up in the table, it is 6.48 times 10 to the minus 3 over kip feet. Okay. 
Now, if you remember, when we did this example in class, we found that the plastic hinge capacity ended up being essentially identical to the lateral torsional buckling capacity. And that's what we're seeing here, right? These two values are essentially the same. With round off, they're basically the same. And so either one of these is going to control, but strictly speaking, you have to take the one that gives you the lower capacity. And remember, lower capacity means a higher BX value. So it turns out the plastic hinge is controlling here. Okay, so this down here controls. Right, just barely. They're essentially the same, but that one barely controls. That's the one we're using. We're going to say the plastic hinge controls. So now let's do that calculation. So now using that plastic hinge capacity, we're going to take P sub PU plus the BX for the plastic hinge times MUX, and that has to be less than or equal to 1.0, like that. Okay, so a lot of this is the same. You've got that 5.64 times 10 to the minus 3 per kip times 50 kip plus now my new value 6.48 times 10 to the minus 3 per kip foot times what is it, 105 kip feet okay you do that calculation no surprise here I get 0.96. It's exactly the same as we did before, and it, which is, of course, less than 1.0. So that beam column will work. Um, so get the exact same thing. Hopefully, though, this is a lot easier, right? We can look things up. It would maybe possibly with the exception of CB. You just got to remember, if you're using CB, just to make sure you check for the plastic hinge capacity as well, make sure you haven't exceeded that when you use CB. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward, and I think it's a lot easier than what we had to do that first day in class. Um, so the last thing I just want to talk about is BY. I haven't talked a whole lot about BY, but um, if you look in this table, I've got a quick question for you. This is always a good exam question. Why does, so if you look at, we've talked about BX and P, and they depend on length, right? You have to look up the effective length or the unbraced length in the table, but BY does not. Okay, if you come, in fact, if you come over to table 6-1, that W10 by 30, when you look up the BY value, it's down here at the bottom, and it gives you that value, and it's just one number, which means it doesn't depend on length. So my question to you, why not? Why is BY, why, how can, how, why is it that we can find BY without knowing what the length of the beam is? It doesn't matter. So what, what I want you to do is there will be a, um, there should be a URL down at the bottom of the screen, Go to that URL just like you did before. Type in your answer. Why do you think that um, BY does not depend on length? And then pause this while you do that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute here. OK, I hope you thought about that for a minute. Why, why does BY not depend on length? Let me tell you why. So, I guess, and we back up, and the reason I like to ask this on exams is because it really gets to what's, what's happening fundamentally to, these, to this beam column as it fails. What are the limit states involved? The reason that the column capacity and the bending about the strong axis, BX, the reason that those depend on length is because they're a buckling phenomenon, right? You've got column buckling. If you look at a beam and it's buckling, you've got that lateral torsional buckling where the top part is buckling. The reason BY doesn't depend on length is because now we're bending about the weak axis, right? we're bending the beam like this, it's not going to buckle, right? You never get lateral torsional buckling when you're bending about the weak axis. I can sit here and do this all day long, it is not going to buckle. So that's why it doesn't depend on length. It doesn't matter how long your beam is, when you're bending about the weak axis, you have one capacity and it's based on, and, and BY is based on that capacity. 